Let's start here with an NPN bipolar transistor and put it in a simple circuit so we can learn about some of its characteristics. Our end goal is to build an amplifier, but we're going to start simple. Let's take our emitter and ground it. We're going to hook up our base to a DC power supply, and I'm going to label the voltage VBE because it's basically the base emitter voltage that we're applying here. Let's label this DC voltage applied to the collector V sub P. P here just stands for power supply. Let's label two currents on the diagram. Let's call that the base current and we'll be calling this the collector current. Let's imagine that we're doing an experiment where I'm going to adjust the voltage on our supply VBE to the base and we'll see how the base current changes. So we're going to start at zero, assume that our power supply is turned off. But the whole time we can assume that we have some positive voltage V sub P applied up here to our collector. It turns out that as I start to apply a voltage VBE, I don't have any base current flowing at all. It stays down here at zero for a time. When I get to about 0.7, I see a sudden change and the base current rises very, very quickly. It's an exponential rise. What does this curve remind you of? Well, it should remind you of a silicon diode. And that's exactly what we have in an NPN transistor. The collector is doped n-type, the base is doped p-type, and the emitter is doped n-type. So if I concentrate only on the base emitter junction, I can see that it's a p-n junction, a forward bias diode in other words. You might recall that to turn a forward bias diode on, you need to apply a voltage greater than about 0.7 volts. The same thing is true with the transistor. If you apply a base emitter voltage less than about 0.7 volts, the transistor is not going to be turning on. This part of the graph is called cutoff. It's called cutoff because the transistor is off. If you don't have any current going into the base, then you're not going to have any current coming down the collector either. What's the equation though that relates the collector current to the base current? I'd now like to introduce the term beta. Beta represents a factor of amplification in a transistor. The number is usually in the neighborhood of 30 to 150 or 200. I can't say for certain what it is because it kind of changes from transistor to transistor. For those transistors that are used for high power applications, the gain or the beta tends to be a smaller number than for those transistors that have been designed to work with lower amounts of power or signal transistors. In any case, when we design amplifiers later, we're going to try to design amplifiers so that the overall voltage gain or the overall power gain of our amplifier is not going to depend too much on beta. For convenience, we can often just estimate beta as being nearly 100. This factor of 100 is where the power gain of a transistor originates. You can now see why the transistor is turned off in this region where the base emitter voltage is less than 0.7. Imagine for a moment that I apply a voltage of 0.3 at the base. That would put me at some point right around here on the curve. What's my collector current going to be? Well, if I use this simple formula to find the collector current, I can see that the base current is zero, and thus the collector current is also zero. The transistor is turned off. If I apply a voltage here greater than 0.7, say 0.8, then the transistor is going to turn on. I have to be very careful here though, because this curve rises exponentially. So if I apply a voltage that's slightly too high to my base, my collector current being a factor of 100 higher than my base current could be enough to burn out the transistor. In other words, this configuration, as I have it drawn right now, although a very simple circuit, is a little bit dangerous and we won't normally design amplifiers like this. Nonetheless, I think the circuit is instructive because it shows how a transistor works. Let's consider another configuration using a PNP transistor instead of an NPN transistor. First, I'm going to delete the transistor and some of my labels. And now we're going to draw in the PNP transistor, keeping all of the voltages the same. Recalling that the emitter is denoted by the arrow, I have the emitter up here and the collector down here. In a PNP transistor, the base current is ordinarily flowing in the opposite direction. I can tell that it's flowing this way because of the direction of the little arrow at the emitter side. 
I have a particular emitter current entering the transistor, some, but not very much of that current splits off to form the base current, and the rest of it winds up as the collector current. The same equation applies here for the PNP transistor. The collector current is a large number, beta, times the base current, and beta is again usually about 100. We're going to have to change our applied voltage in order to get our transistor to work properly because it's no longer the voltage from the base to the ground that matters, but the voltage from our power supply to our base that matters. Let's change the labels. I'll call it the voltage from emitter to base because this is the emitter right here. The emitter base voltage should be a positive number. With these changes, everything is now equivalent to the way it was with the NPN transistor. If our base voltage is too high, that is, if the voltage is too close to the emitter voltage, then we'll be in the cutoff mode. As I lower down my base voltage, then it widens out this voltage drop a little bit and I move further right on the curve here. The emitter base voltage drop then gets larger and larger. So to turn the transistor on, if it's a PNP transistor, one lowers down the base voltage so that the voltage drop here gets larger. With the NPN transistor, you raise the voltage at the base to turn it on. So that's the main difference between an NPN transistor and a PNP transistor. I mentioned that the beta of a transistor is usually around 100. Let's now take a look at a data sheet for a very common transistor, the 2N2222, and see what its beta is from the data sheet. The reason why I wanted to do this is because sometimes data sheets don't use beta. They use something else called HFE. So if you look for HFE, it basically just means beta. We can see here that the parameter is labeled DC current gain. Therefore, I know that it's beta. This is the ratio of the collector current to the base current. So it really does represent a gain here. They're saying here in the conditions where it's being measured, if the collector current is 10 milliamps and the collector emitter voltage is 10 volts, then beta is at least 75. If we look at the next page of the transistor's data sheet though, we find that it's a little bit more complicated than that. Again, I find in the symbol column HFE, that just means beta, the DC current gain. But look, as the collector current changes from 100 microamps to 150 milliamps, we have a whole range of different beta values that result from the transistor. This might complicate the design of an amplifier if the gain of our amplifier has a strong dependence on the beta. So our job when we design amplifier circuits is to try to make our designs a little bit robust against small variations in beta. So that's what we're going to look at in future videos. But for now, I just wanted to point out that at least we can count on the beta not being too low. I mean, 100 microamps is a really small amount of current flowing and we already have a beta of about 35. That means that the current on the load side of the transistor can be at least 35 times higher than the load on the source side. So it's very clear that a transistor can give us gain. The question is how we can design a circuit in order to be robust given these variations that one can expect in the normal operation of a transistor.